USA Warrior Stories is a not-for-profit organization designed to record, archive, and share videos of veterans' stories to help veterans make a connection with one another and to help us all better understand their sacrifices for our freedoms. I think the thing that really got me interested in the military and, and veterans in their service time was that fact that my grandfather was a veteran. Uh, he served in the Navy in World War II. And thanks to my family collecting a lot of his uh, photographs and images from his service time, I got to know him and I was always proud of him. He served in the Pacific uh, with the Navy Seabees. He was an engineer, a lieutenant commander. That's his picture behind me. and. Uh, I uh, always had a lot of respect. I, I was fortunate enough to have uh, been given a lot of his uh, military insignia from my grandmother, and I always coveted that and, and respected that. And uh, I think that really began my uh, interest and admiration for uh, veterans, and uh, especially World War II, but all of the uh, conflicts. And uh, that really has stuck with me, and I'm, I'm very proud to be working with veterans and helping showcase their stories of how they serve the country. My grandfather was born in 1900 in Islip, New York. He had one sister named Lillian and they grew up together. He basically loved to hunt and fish as most, uh, I guess, young guys did back then. Long Island was a basically country farmland at that time, back in the early 1900s. Uh, in 1919, he was uh, accepted into Webb Institute and uh, started uh, going to school for engineering. After continuing and getting a three-year degree in engineering at Webb Institute, he uh, came back to Long Island and to his family and started working at the city of Queens, borough of Queens, uh, in their engineering uh, department. In 1924, my grandfather met my grandmother, Mary Rowlandson. She later became a teacher in Islip. They settled down, bought a little house, and started to raise a family. During my grandfather's uh, work at the Borough of Queens in the engineering department, he became a chief engineer on the big project, which was the Midtown Tunnel. So on December 7th, 1941, the Japanese attacked us. Their destination, Pearl Harbor. Like so many other American men and women, my grandfather answered the call of duty and uh, was uh, assigned to the Naval Reserve. Uh, because of his engineering education, he went in as a lieutenant and uh, became an officer in the reserve. So World War II was a really big uh, impact on uh, the industry of the country. Uh, we really weren't ramped up uh, in any way or shape to produce an army and all the material and things we would need to go and fight this world war. You know, through the process we had to start building, uh, just start up the machine, the war machine, basically to start producing equipment and supplies. Beyond that, we also had to have a plan and there was a, basically a five road plan to uh, take on the Axis forces, uh, Germany and Japan and Italy across the Atlantic and into the Pacific. A new war presented new problems and a new solution. For out of the very fire that the Japs left behind them was forged a unique type of service organization, the Navy's Construction Battalion. So in 1942, we also realized that we would need to have a, a huge amount of personnel, tradesmen, to be able to work on projects to create infrastructure and to bring the war to the enemy. Recognizing the need for an organization of skilled workers to build advanced bases in active theaters of war, the Bureau of Yards and Docks obtained authority for the establishment of the 1st Naval Construction Battalion in charge of officers of the Civil Engineer Corps of the Navy. From this 1st Battalion of 1,100 officers and men, the personnel of the CBs increased with the demands of war to 3,300, 10,000, 30,000, until at the present time, the total authorized strength is 222 active battalions, 
with approximately 290,000 officers and men. So being that the CBs, or the Construction Battalion, was a brand new branch of the Navy and the military, uh, really starting from scratch, we had to find skilled tradesmen, engineers of all types to be able to do all the work that was going to be necessary to make this plan work. The Construction Battalion would be set up and trained for building vital military infrastructure overseas, building things like camps, bases, roads, bridges, hospitals, and utilities to support them. Not to mention all the important airfields and the Army Air Force accommodations. As I said, along with the task of this construction that the battalions had to perform and all their duties, they also were charged to defend them. So in the motto of the Seabees, we build, we fight, they had to carry arms and be prepared to fight the enemy. The insignia that the CBs decided to use was a fighting bee. The CBs motto is we build, we fight. So the insignia itself has, shows a bee holding a weapon and actually tools to do the work. So as I said, my grandfather, Harry Rowlandson, was actually assigned to the Naval Reserve in 1943 in New York. And he quickly uh, was assigned to the 112th Construction Battalion and was shipped out for boot camp. So on July 1st, 1943, he was transported to Camp Peary in Williamsburg, Virginia, and did his eight weeks of training. There he learned about weaponry and basic training. Also uh, at that same camp is where they actually first trained the underwater demolition teams. So next in September of 1943, after boot camp, the 112th was moved up to Maine. They basically had to build out the camp themselves. They ended up converting an old New Deal program, National Youth Association building, into their new camp. This camp would later be called Lee Stevenson. Following that, in December 1943, my grandfather and 112th were moved across the country to Port Wainimi in California. My grandfather had a distinction for being the leader for Platoon 5 in Company C. At some point in February 1944, the 112th uh, was told that they would be going to Island X overseas and that they would have to prepare themselves to uh, convoy and board ship in California, uh, Camp Wainimi, and then move out to this Island X. A couple of days into their travel uh, on the Pacific, the men of the 112th were told on board ship that their destination of Island X would be Pearl Harbor uh, on Oahu. And uh, they uh, quickly uh, had to set up camp at Monolua Ridge, which is basically a, a muddy ridge mountainside that they had to set up and uh, bivouac their campsites. Upon arriving at the Monolua Ridge site, the 112th had to begin quickly building roads and permanent housing. In June of 1944, the men of the 112th were moved over to the Keniohe Naval Air Station on Oahu, which was known then as the Country Club of the Pacific. They began with construction which comprised of a 5,000 by 400 foot runway paved with two and a half inches of asphalt and concrete constructed from coral fill that they had dredged from the bay via hydraulic dredge. During their training and stay at the Naval Air Station, the company's troops were marched on review in front of the battalion commanders. On August 5th, 1944, the 112th celebrated their one year anniversary at the Naval Air Station. This was complete with a large cake with Miss Fixit cutting the cake. During his stay in Hawaii, my grandfather and other CBs got to enjoy some R&R &R on Oahu, including sightseeing on the island, enjoying some of the beaches, the local attractions, and they had a pretty nice uh, officer's club and a dance hall set up too. So December 15, 1944, the entire battalion of 112th of my grandfather got convoyed by truck from the Naval Air Station to Pearl Harbor dockside where they waited ships where they would be heading eventually to unknown island called X-2. For the next 12 days and 3,300 nautical miles, the battalion crisscrossed the Pacific Ocean with their naval escort ships heading to Island X-2, somewhere in the Marianas. During the crossing, they kept up with training and exercises, witnessed anti-aircraft and submarine drills, and took advantage of any downtime as much as possible. Church services also were provided on deck as well. At some point in time during the crossing of the Pacific, 
the 112th was informed that they would be going to the island of Tinian, which was their island X2. Tinian and its neighboring islands of Saipan and Guam had recently been taken from the Japanese by our Marines, the 2nd and the 4th Marine Divisions, at a heavy loss of life. As with most amphibious landings, not only were the Marines involved in the Navy, specifically on Tinian, the Seabees 5th, 6th, and 7th units had to go in and clear the beaches prior to the Marines. An interesting note about Tinian was the fact that it was one of the first locations that we ever used napalm uh, in our effort in the war. The Marianas were a very important part of the Pacific road to winning the war. Uh, we had to set up strategic locations to island hop, and Tinian would prove to be one of the most important to setting up the Army Air Corps' B-29 bases and crews. Tinian would be the home of one of the largest airports ever built in the Pacific. There were some last minute changes in the plan of the amphibious landing on Tinian, and it required a uh, landing on a different location, which was really a, a good thing because uh, the Japanese weren't prepared for us to make uh, a landing on the northwest side of Tinian. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it was a different terrain and we had some problems landing the amphibious craft there, so the CB's ingenuity created a uh, different type of ramp allowing the Marines to get off and uh, once again showing the ingenuity of what CB's were known for as the can-do type of mentality. Upon arriving at Tinian, the first thing that was needed to be done was unload the LSTs with all the equipment and supplies that they had to start building and working with. Uh, they had to clear a lot of the cane fields. Uh, Tinian was full of sugar cane fields and also Japanese um, memorials and uh, religious locations that they had to take into consideration during their engineering. After the creation of the temporary bivouac camp and clearing of more fields, a permanent camp was created. This camp was built up with an administrative building headquarters, a galley, a Quonset huts for a hospital, a medical facility, and even included an outdoor theater. During the early days of working on Tinian and getting uh, their camp set up, there were still Japanese factions uh, shooting and fighting from caves and uh, locations on the island of Tinian. And the Seabees, which is their slogan, we build, we fight, had to fend off as they were building in construction uh, these uh, attackers. And, and they ended up capturing uh, quite a few during the process of doing their work on the island. As a battalion of the 6th Brigade, construction was started on one of the largest air bases in the world, providing facilities for the Army's B-29 fortresses. Hall roads were built through the cane fields and the new coral pits opened. A salt water line was constructed to provide a half a million gallons of water per day for the airport's construction. The B-29 airbase comprised the construction of two 8,500 by 500 airstrips, 200 B-29 hard stands, and two service aprons, including warehouses, airplane repair facilities, roads, and utilities. And a total of 5 million yards of fill material used in the construction. Over 2 million yards was coral, which had to be hauled by a fleet of 400 trucks. One of the most important results of the work on Tinian and something my grandfather helped out on, was building of those airfields on Tinian. A uh, key component to the planned strategy of the war was to get those B-29s having platforms on the islands in Tinian and Saipan specifically, along with Guam, were used to launch these B-29s to attack Japan. My grandfather and the 112th Battalion was proud to sponsor one of the B-29 fortresses Harry and the 112th Battalion was proud to have officially opened the West Field on the island. The 112th was uh, able to witness one of the first bombing runs created from those runways on the homeland of Japan. In late May of 1945, the battalion was ordered to prepare to move to Island X-3, which turned out to be Okinawa. Just prior to the CBs arriving on Okinawa, uh, the Marines again had... Uh, had a three-month battle to take that island from the Japanese in one of the biggest amphibious landings in the Pacific up to that date and one of the uh, most costly fights for the Marines. So after unloading and arriving in Okinawa, they were placed in a location to bivouac and uh, 
that island had been taken during the rainy season in tropical storms, uh, and they ended up nicknaming that bivouac camp Camp Mud because of this the horrible conditions and so much mud from all the rain and the typhoons that happened. 112th immediately received orders to start work on building a 400-bed hospital. This would be part of a 5,000-bed facility planned to help take care of the predicted large number of casualties that would be coming from the eventual landing and invasion of the Japanese homeland. Along with the infrastructure, road construction, large communication facilities, the 112th still had to deal with Japanese snipers and attackers. Meanwhile, back on Tinian, there was a top secret B-29 mission being planned and executed from the very runways that the CBs had just completed. Soon after, on August 6th and 9th, U.S. forces dropped atomic weapons and detonated over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and the Japanese surrendered. And on September 2nd, 1945, the Japanese signed the unconditional surrender. After VJ Day, the 112th Battalion was engaged in winding up a few jobs needed to post-war Okinawa. Men were sent home on a point system, and my grandfather was soon returned home with an honorable discharge back to his Islip, New York family. After the war, my grandfather returned to his civil engineering job in Queens, New York. Unfortunately, a few years later, he passed away suddenly from a heart attack at the early age of 52. He was given a military funeral and was buried at the Pine Lawn Cemetery on Long Island. You know, I'm very proud of my grandfather and his service to the country as a Navy CB, um, understanding what he did, what they went through, and what they accomplished. The CB's motto is, can do and understanding all the work that they did do. It's just an amazing feat that we were able to accomplish and we all got behind and won that war.